Hey everybody, Dr. R here. In this video, we're gonna talk about exercise physiology. And this is one of those topics that kind of gets looked over a little bit, but there are still a lot of important questions that kind of come from this. And so we're gonna recap a lot of these topics that we've kind of already talked about, but we'll integrate it into the exercise realm. And then we'll talk a little bit about the FIC principle, how that relates to cardiac output and rate of oxygen consumption in exercise. We'll talk about oxygen extraction efficiency, and then we'll also relate this to athletes and how cardiac output is affected in, in that population as well. Physiologic changes of exercise. I know this slide looks intimidating, but we're just gonna simplify this. What's the simple way to remember what happens in exercise? Well, think about your fight or flight. We're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, right? So we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system. If you can remember what the sympathetic nervous system is doing, you can answer a lot of these questions. So the sympathetic nervous system is gonna cause increases in contractility, for example, right? This is something that we've already talked about before. A lot of this is mediated by the beta receptors. Okay, so we can have increases in contractility. We can also get increases in afterload. Okay, so we can get increases in afterload. We'll just put AL there. And we can also get increases in preload. And the increases in preload are usually, normally, if I activate the sympathetic nervous system, I'm thinking about venoconstriction and shunting blood back up to the heart. I'm thinking about increases in afterload from constriction of the arterioles, right? Because they're gonna increase my total peripheral resistance. And then I'm thinking, like we said, of increases in contractility, right? That are also increasing my stroke volume, my cardiac output. Venoconstriction is usually what you would expect to see. Increases in venous return, we've gone through this so many times, that's gonna increase the amount of blood returning to the heart, increasing left ventricular and diastolic volume. Remember, this is decreasing the venous compliance so that we get more blood back up to the heart. You can also get vasoconstriction. Again, this is all going back to that sympathetic response. But the key here is that the vasoconstriction is usually gonna be at the splanchnic vessels. And so the reason for this, if you think about it, if you're in a fight or flight situation, you don't want to rest and digest, right? You wanna get all that blood in the GI system out. And you wanna get that blood into the skeletal muscles that are gonna allow for more oxygen perfusion so that those muscles accept more electrons and eventually generate more ATP. And so that's generally what we're talking about. So we wanna get blood out of the GI tract because we're not in parasympathetic land, we're in sympathetic land where we wanna get as much blood to the skeletal muscles and away from the GI system. That's why sometimes if people run really long distance or they have a lot of cardiovascular activity where they don't have blood in the GI tract for a long period of time, they might have symptoms like diarrhea, for example, because they weren't getting perfusion to the GI tract for an extended period of time. Now. The tricky part here is these two kind of make sense because you're thinking about your sympathetic response. You're saying, yeah, venoconstriction, vasoconstriction, that's what I would expect, alpha-1 mediated response. But the vasodilation is actually where the questions start to come up here, um, where it gets tricky. Okay, so vasodilation occurs at skeletal muscle. Again, that's because we want increased perfusion to the skeletal muscles during times of exercise, particularly the skeletal muscles that are being used during exercise. Okay, so we get vasodilation to the skeletal muscles. Now, that in and of itself, if I vasodilate a significant area of skeletal muscle, that's going to decrease the systemic vascular resistance, right? Because I have all of this vasodilation in the systemic vasculature at all these sites of skeletal muscle, you know, especially if I'm undergoing moderate or heavy exercise, that's actually gonna decrease my systemic vascular resistance because we're vasodilating. And we already said before, the SVR is actually proportional to the diastolic blood pressure. So if I drop my SVR, I'm actually dropping my diastolic blood pressure. The place where this gets confusing and can kind of get you into trouble is that there is actually an increase in afterload. So, you know, up to this point, I've told you that pretty much when you have increases in systemic vascular resistance, you usually will have increases in the diastolic blood pressure and usually, almost all the time, you would expect to have increases in afterload and vice versa. If I had decrease the SVR, I would expect to decrease my diastolic blood pressure and decrease my afterload, okay? That's normally how we've kind of thought of this. But what the exercise does is it kind of says, hold on a second, that's not exactly true, okay? Because we are going to have a decrease in diastolic blood pressure, decrease in systemic vascular resistance due to the vasodilation. However, we're going to have an overall increase in afterload. Where this comes from, this overall increase in afterload, is because the contractility goes up so much more 
then the decrease in the systemic vascular resistance. The contractility goes up dramatically, and as does the preload in some regard. And so what happens is the left ventricular and aortic pressures in systole get really, really high, and the systemic vascular resistance goes down a bit, but not enough to compensate for this dramatic jump in contractility and preload during exercise. And for that reason in particular, the afterload actually goes up because that contractility and that preload increase actually generates a larger left ventricular afterload, right? A pressure that the left ventricle has to kind of fight against, okay? Because of that very high contractility and preload. And so that's the tricky part. That's probably the hardest thing to remember, you know, about this slide in particular and about exercise because again it kind of goes against your standard thought thought process so you have an overall decrease in systemic vascular resistance due to vasodilation at skeletal muscle but you have an overall increase in your afterload and the rest of this stuff if you can understand that the rest of this stuff really makes intuitive sense especially if you've been following the video series along so far. So increases in heart rate, again, just have to do with sympathetic tone. If I increase my sympathetic nervous system, I'm gonna expect increases in heart rate, okay? And that's also due to withdrawal of vagal tone, which is, again, associated with a parasympathetic response. The next part here, we've talked about this, decreases in coronary perfusion. Remember, coronary perfusion primarily is going to occur in diastole. Remember, the concept with coronary perfusion is that we're already extracting a significant amount of oxygen in the myocardium, okay? So when I start to decrease the time spent in diastole, the only way I can really compensate for that is through vasodilation, okay? And, and again, if I have somebody that has coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis, they might already be maximally dilated, and I can't dilate much more. And that's why those patients, when they exercise, they develop angina, they get chest pain, because they're developing ischemia because they're maximally dilated, and now you have decreased time spent in coronary perfusion. Okay, so one thing we haven't touched on much is minute ventilation, which has to do with your respiratory rate and your tidal volume. But you can imagine somebody that's exercising, you would expect them to have a higher respiratory rate, a higher tidal volume. They're consuming more oxygen and creating more CO2, right? The oxygen is being consumed because we need to generate ATP, right? Think about electron transport chain. And then the CO2 is being produced, you know, for example, the citric acid cycle. And then temperature, you know, if somebody's running, for example, again, this kind of makes intuitive sense, the temperature is going to go up. We're gonna be generating heat as we start to runs short on some of the supply of, of oxygen as we're exercising, we'll start to develop a lactic acidosis, usually, you know, especially with like strength exercises where, you know, you can quickly fatigue a muscle so it's not able to have enough oxygen to completely replenish its ATP stores. And so you start to have a lactic acidosis build up really quickly. If you think of someone doing bicep curls, right? You do, you can only do so many reps before that bicep really starts to tire out. And so you get this localized decrease in arterial pH.